This is Kuhn from uh, Plumer. Uh, go ahead, Kuhn. Yes, thanks, Ian, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining. So today I will be presenting Plumerai's new solution for person detection on the edge. By using binarized neural networks, we have developed an extremely efficient uh, person detection model for ARM Cortex-M microcontrollers. And I'm very excited because today I will not just be talking about this solution, but we will actually show the model in a live demo on, ST on an STM32 discovery board. But first, let me tell you a bit about Plumerai. Plumerai is a startup that was founded with the goal of making deep learning tiny and radically more efficient in order to enable inference on the edge. We do this by focusing on a new type of deep learning models, binarized neural networks, or BNNs for short. Using BNNs, we build complete solutions, and we offer two types of products. First, we have software solutions aimed at off-the-shelf existing chips, such as ARM microcontrollers. Um, and these solutions include both trained models and all the software required to run them. So you can run them out of the box. If you need even more performance, we also offer solutions at the hardware level through IP cores for low powered FPGAs that are specifically designed for running BNNs efficiently. So what are BNNs and why are they so powerful? Um, so as you probably know, deep learning models today contain millions, if not billions of weights and activations. And traditionally, these are represented as 32 bits floating point numbers. Uh, however, it soon became clear that you don't really need all that precision. And today it is quite common to instead use 8-bit integers. Um, but why stop there? We already see people going to 4 bits or even lower. BNN simply take this trend to its logical conclusion and represent every weight and activation in the network as a single bit. This is really powerful for two reasons. And the first is memory. By binarizing the weights of your model, you get the maximum amount of control over every bit. You can tune each bit perfectly independently of all the other parameters in the network. And this allows you to do more with less. So you can build smaller models for the same level of accuracy. The other thing that makes BNNs work so well is lies in the computation itself. Uh, matrix multiplications are by far the most important computation in deep learning models. And if you work with 8-bit integers or 32-bit floating point numbers, these require expensive element-wise multiplications followed by large sums. If instead we work with binarized models, we can replace these with XNORs and pop counts simple bitwise instructions that make BNNs extremely fast and extremely energy efficient. So that is uh, th that are BNNs in a nutshell. Now let's apply this to a real problem. Person detection is an important task in TinyML with many uh, potential applications. It would be amazing if we could solve this task on cheap off-the-shelf microcontrollers. And that is exactly what we've done. So the goal of the task is simple. Given frames like these, we want to predict bounding boxes for every person in the frame. If we can do this, there are lots of potential applications and we especially see a lot of interest in things like smart home appliances, smart offices and smart retail. So that is the problem. Now let's look at our solution. The demo we'll show you runs on an STM 32H7B3 discovery board and at a clock speed of 280 megahertz, we have a latency of well below one second. Note that this particular board runs an ARM Cortex-M7 core, but you, with enough memory, you can run the same model on, for example, a Cortex-M4. So let's get into it. Uh, I'll now stop sharing my slides. So you should just see me. Uh, and then we'll use the coffee corner next to us to actually demonstrate the model. So let's go there now. So here you can see the setting. And now let's watch as the scene through the eyes of our model. So here you can see our person detection model running on an H7 board. As you can see, 
uh, it's running very smoothly at well over one frame per second. There's a green box indicating to sh sh uh, that the model recognizes me as a person. You can see that the model has no trouble recognizing me as the camera moves or if I move. If I turn my back on the camera, it still works. And if I sit down, it still works. So this is all one person, but let's see what happens if my colleague Mai enters the frame. As we can see, the model still works correctly. And also if Ruland enters the frame, we can see it correctly recognizes all three of us. Now, if you look at Ruland, you can see that the orientation really doesn't matter. We recognize him from all angles correctly. So that's one setting and that's all we can show in this uh, short talk. But I actually want to say that the model generalizes very well to other settings. And I want to emphasize that we've not trained the model for this specific setting beforehand. So the model really does work well. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first time that someone runs person detection in real time on an ARM Cortex-M microcontroller. These chips are available off the shelf and are extremely popular for embedded applications. So we're very exciting to be bringing this new capability to the platform. Now I'll share my slides again. Hopefully that works. Can you share, can, would you share in the other mode to remove your um, uh, icons at the bottom? Uh, okay, yes, this, I think this is better now. Okay, so let's continue. How did we pull this off? Um, at Plumerai, we take an integrated approach to developing our applications. Um, if you really want the best possible performance, this should also include custom hardware. And like I mentioned, we offer custom IP cores for low powered SPGAs if you need this. But our software solutions uh, only use the first three of these layers. So let's go through each of them and see why integrating them matters. First, data. In deep learning, uh, you can have all the fancy algorithms that you want, but at the end of the day, it's really the data that determines the capabilities of the model. Uh, as we are develop, uh, delivering fully trained models, it is our responsibility to make sure these are trained on the correct data. Uh, when we started working on this problem, we very quickly discovered that relying on public data sets such as COCO and open images is really not enough. There are just too many ways in which the real world is different that is not covered in these data sets. The camera quality is lower, the framing is different, people stand with their backs to the camera more often, etc. So instead, we're committed to collecting our own uh, data. And we do this in a targeted manner, identifying where the model struggles and addressing those specific problems. And we found that this is really key to developing models that work robustly in the real world. Once we have collected our data, we need to train the models. And this is where we bring our main expertise to the table. Uh, like I said, BNNs are very powerful, but they can also be hard to work with. With the, power, with the freedom of tuning every bit individually, also comes the flip side that training the model becomes much more difficult. In addition to that, we found that there is a lot of experience in the field of deep, lear deep learning, tips and tricks, rules of thumb for training and designing models that do not translate well to a binary setting. Um, so to tackle those challenges over the past years, we have assembled a brilliant team. And in these publications, you can see some of the work that we've done. 
So this deep understanding of binarization is what enables us to actually deliver on the promise of PNNs and to train these models effectively. The third part of our integrated approach lies in the interface between hardware and software. Existing deep learning uh, uh, deployment stacks, such as TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, do not support BNNs, and therefore we've built our own inference stack. Our team is intricately familiar with each of the hardware platforms that we target, and we leverage this knowledge to build amazingly fast inference kernels and also to inform the model design so that each model is perfectly tailored to the hardware platform it runs on. So that gives you a taste of the things that went into developing this model. To end, uh, I want to say that we're just getting started. Um, we are working hard to bring binarization to new hardware platforms. In fact, yesterday, Laszlo from Exmos gave a great talk on their new Xcore AI platform, which I highly recommend you watch because it's really amazingly fast. Like I said, we're also developing our own IP course for low-powered FPGAs that are specifically designed for running BNNs. On the application side, we have a lot in the pipeline. Uh, today, I just talked about person detection, but we already have a, a person presence detection model, and we're very excited to bring BNNs to new applications, such as speech recognition and hand gesture recognition. That was all for today. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them now, or you can always reach out to me at kuhn at .com. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kuhn. That was a, a great talk, a very exciting demo, very cool. Uh, so a couple questions have come in, you know, some around, uh, can you say anything about the net architecture? Is this something that's totally from scratch or is this based on, you know, some existing backbone and then binarized? Uh, yeah, so the, the architecture is something that we develop fully in-house. Uh, th this is proprietary, so part of the solution, so I can't can share any details about the specifics of the architecture. Um, but we, we spend a lot of energy on uh, on architecture search to make sure that it is, is really perfectly tuned and the most efficient thing that we can run on these microcontrollers. Cool. Um, and on the uh, for the demo, what is the actual full frame rate for that uh, for that demo? So uh, what I just showed runs at eight hundred and ninety five milliseconds. Uh, so that's including the uh, camera capture and the frame rendering. So the frame rate is well over one frame per second, uh, roughly 1.1. 1 .1. And Excellent. this is on a, a, a Cortex M7 board. So it does also run on an M4. That of course has a lower clock speed, so it will also be a bit, bit slower. Right, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, and so for the, the data set for that, that's your own internal data set, set for, for everything? Yes, so so we do start off with these public data sets, but then we spend a lot of energy uh, into the, uh, building our own data sets. Um, so what we do is we go out in the, with these models into the field to see where they struggle. Um, so for example, early on, we saw that it really struggles with uh, having people with their back to the camera, because this is something that is not very common in these uh, public data sets. And then we go out to the, uh, collect our own data in order to address those issues. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a question on the on the inference software stack. Um, it sounded like you guys uh, really rolled up your sleeves and and uh, did a lot of that yourselves. What, what was the most challenging aspect? Was it kind of performance? You know, hand hand uh, crafting assembly. Was it footprint for the SRAM? What, what were the biggest challenges there? Yeah, so I think uh, it, it's definitely true that we spend a lot of energy on making the performance as, as fast as possible. Um, so I, I think we spend most time on, on, on the assembly kernels, but also the whole um, inference stack is very important. So we found that for our development, it's extremely important that we can quickly train a model, a new architecture, and then convert it and run it on hardware. Uh, so we, we have invested a lot of there as well. I should say we're not building everything from scratch. We are building on top of existing technologies such as MLIR that are great. Um, and, and we leverage that to get the best possible performance. Uh, interesting. Now, now I'm intrigued. Is that uh, work within MLIR something you've kind of done in the public? Is there a, a dialect you guys have done or is this kind of just in-house work that you've done? 
Yeah, so there is, uh, so so we have, uh, don't, I think we don't have our own dialect, but there is uh, some uh, stuff on this available in our open source uh, projects. So we have Lark and uh, Lark Compute Engine. If you're interested in binarized networks, I really recommend you, you look at those. And in Lark Compute Engine, uh, you, you can see uh, some of the, the conversion stuff that, that we have. Great. Um, thank you very much. I think that, that covers the, the questions and great, uh, great two talks. So thank you, Vikrant and, and Kuhn. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors. First, it's ARM uh, that develops software and hardware for TinyML. Qualcomm, Samsung, these three are the executive, executive sponsors. And, and then followed by Platinum sponsors, PTA Compute, Lattice Semiconductors, and the gold sponsors are Brain Chip Corporation, Cisco, DSP Group, H Impulse, Emza Visual Sense, Gerald Matter Labs, uh, Green Waves Technologies, Hymex, Imagine Mob, Legend AI. Maxim Integrated, Pixel, Reality AI, SenseML, Silicon Labs, Sintiant and Google TensorFlow. Exmos and the silver sponsors are H Cortex, Hoots, and uh, Sinsense. Again, we are very grateful for their continued support, and this is a great testimony that uh, the foundation and this community is, re is really of, of huge interest for for the companies and 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 for the whole uh, for the whole world.